Today I'm going to talk about sharpening chisels and what we have here is a Lee Nielsen chisel, premium level. I use it on a daily basis. It's one of my go-tos and we are going to compare sharpening this chisel versus a lower tiered option, the Irwin Marples, brand new out of the box. We're going to look at the edge. We're going to see how long it takes to sharpen to get it up to the level that I would consider sharp. We're going to discuss what is sharp and we're going to compare it we're gonna use the Stanley Sweetheart chisels as well. And both of these options are available at big box stores um, versus an individual seller online producing high quality tools. So what is the difference between a premium level and a mid tier or a lower tier option? And things like edge retention. How long does the edge last after you sharpen it? How long does it take to get sharp? What is sharp? How flat? is the back of the chisel. All these things that matter in what determines a high quality chisel and if it works in your shop or not. So we are gonna look at all of those options. We're gonna run through the sharpening process start to finish. It's not a definitive guide for sharpening. It's my method of sharpening. I'm gonna show a couple different options, but really in the end, we wanna know, can a low tier or mid tier chisel match the level and performance of a premium level chisel. So let's take a look. So obviously the Lee and Nielsen are used. I use these on a daily basis. So we know that these are not new, but they will perform well. I know that that's a known. The new chisels are the Stanley Sweetheart series. So let's go ahead and pull those out. And we are gonna sharpen uh, maybe like a half inch and a uh, three quarter inch chisel. So I'm gonna pull both of those out. Another thing we're gonna do is look at the type of chisels that these are. So we're gonna pull out the three quarter Irwin, which also comes with a leather case and the half inch. With the chisels pulled out, we have our three quarter and half inch of every type. And you can look at these and see that there's a difference in the handle, the length. Uh, what we have on the Lee Nielsen and the Stanley is a socket chisel where the handle goes into a steel socket that is a part of the blade. It comes apart. This can be replaced. Um, you can see the disadvantages with wood movement, expansion and contraction. This handle can come out fairly easily, but it's also really easy to go like this, hold the socket and tap it onto the table so that it drives the wood back in. That's steady, it's gonna stay in, uh, but it does happen with seasonal change. You have this type of chisel, which is called a tang chisel, and the tang is part of the steel that actually drives into the wood and is held on with pressure using a ferrule. Um, and this is a great chisel. However, if you were to really go to town on hitting this with a hard mallet or something, potentially this handle could split out, um, whereas this, continuously drives the wood into the socket. So it's a little better for hard hitting. Um, and it's a little smaller of a handle. It fits in nicely. I prefer this, uh, but it's definitely a preference thing. There's different handle types, different chisel types, all of those things. But really we're just comparing edge retention, what it takes to get to sharp and what these are like out of the box for a typical woodworking chisel. So let's take a look further. We're gonna take the Lee Nelson chisel and a Sterrett rule, which is pretty dang flat, not precision, precision ground, but it is flat enough to use as a reference. So we are gonna put it on the edge from corner to corner, and we're gonna look at that and see if there's any light that can pass through between the rule and the back of the chisel. So we, we're gonna go edge to edge, corner to corner, and just really determine if we think this back is totally flat or not. All right, so as we grab the Irwin chisel, I'm gonna put it on this background so the camera will focus. Um, we can pull the cover off and look at it. And what we see on the back is that there are these mill marks. And that actually has a texture. If you listen, you can hear. So that is gonna be a challenge to remove. And right off the bat, you can look at this edge and see that there is a chip, major chip right there. And that does not look great. Um, yet again, mill marks here. So it is a very rough chisel, even though it says sharp and ready to use um, on the box. And it does cut. However, those chips 
will uh, be a problem for a razor edge. Moving on to the flatness check. If you look at the top right there, you can see there is a little bit of a, a flare at the top where it pulls away from the chisel or the rule. And that is definitely not flat. The most important part of the chisel is actually this edge. And I'll explain that later. Um, but as I move it around, it does flatten. So may maybe I was just too far down on this edge. Let's look. Yeah, I would say it's probably flat. Moving on to the Stanley three quarter, pull the cover off. And we can see that we have those mill marks again. However, these are a lot milder than the other one. It still has that texture. The back, same thing. Um, nothing crazy there. If we come and look at the edge, we have similar micro chips in there. Um, nothing terrible, but definitely not a completely finished fresh edge uh, it's a rough mill as well we'll really see this exaggerated on the stone because it'll polish this surface um, on the high spots and if there's any low spots it'll still have these mill marks so we'll really get to see that next all right, so I wanted to point out on the Lee Nielsen, uh, we have this reflective edge right here, and that is the primary bevel. And that is at 30 degrees, which is what we're gonna sharpen these other chisels to. And then if you look at the very end edge, where that is glistening now right on the edge, that is 35 degrees, and that's called a secondary bevel. And so the advantage of that secondary bevel is sharpening again for a second time is quick and easy because all I'm doing is that tiny little edge versus this entire primary bevel. So that's a way to get a chisel sharp with maintenance. And that'll be critical moving forward on all of these chisels. Um, but we're going we're gonna to show that in the process of sharpening. Another critical element is this edge being square to the sides of the chisel. That matters for a lot of the joinery that you would use a chisel on. And we're gonna check that quickly with a square and just, yes, we're square. If it was majorly off, I would be really surprised, but that is a thing that matters. When we sharpen it, it will go square um, because of the way that the jig mounts to the sides of the chisel. As long as they're parallel, it will work. So what do we need to sharpen? Uh, we need a handful of things. We need a flat surface and that can be made using a piece of float glass. Um, this is a process where this is a super flat piece, granite that's been milled, a lot of options. You have water stones, uh, you have glass stones. Again, a piece of float glass with a stone mounted to it. Um, a plate that, diamond plate, which actually will flatten these stones as they're used. Um, but that is a critical thing. We have a flat surface. You can use sandpaper on float glass and water holds it down with, uh, that works well. Uh, we can use the stones that I have. There's different levels of stones, just like there's different levels of chisels. I use a product called Honrite, which just keeps the water uh, chemically uh, at a level to where it will not rust a chisel if it is left on there a drop or two. Um, and then we need a guide of some form, a jig that holds the chisel at a correct angle. And what we're going to do is use the Lee Nelson jig for all of them. There's a lot of different jigs. There's very similar ones that are a lot less expensive. However, this works perfectly every time. And that's why we're going to use it on this video. Um, essentially, it rides as the chisel is put in here at whatever angle you slide it in at, lock it down, that will ride on the stone or the glass with the paper at the, and hold it at that angle. So that is a critical thing. Uh, when you're learning how to sharpen, if you're touching up, you can take a chisel, find the bevel, and sharpen by hand. However, there is some rocking that can happen, and that will not be perfectly flat. Um, I'm not going to say that people can't do it, but it's a pretty Im impressive skill to learn uh, to freehand sharpen. Uh, but this is a precision tool and allows us to dial it into whatever degree we want. 
uh, based on a measurement and how far the blade is pushed out past the end of the jig. And then when we put that down, that creates the bevel. So let's take a look at all of this. Um, we, I use this tray to contain the water in the mess. Um, in the end, what we're gonna do is a leather strap where a polishing compound is put on a piece of leather and that will allow us to do a real fine cut on the steel at the end just to really refine that edge and get a high polish. Some people do it, some people don't. Yet again, it's a personal preference thing. Just like the secondary bevel is a per personal preference, sharpening is a personal preference. So that's a uh, gimme. So let's take a look at the edge uh, of all these sharpening process and see what the results are and how we get there. All right, so the absolute first thing we're gonna do is flatten the back of the chisel. And the reason we wanna do that is because this back is our reference surface for the entire joinery process. If you're going down in mortise, this back is riding on the wood. If you're paring, this back is riding on the wood. There's a lot of reasons that this needs to be flat as a reference surface to the bevel. So whatever this is, our angle on the bevel is based off of this being flat. So it's a critical thing to do. I'm gonna take some paper, uh, get it wet on the glass and the back of the paper. This is wet, dry paper, and just really get it stuck down to my piece of float glass. Next steps are gonna be taking the back of the chisel. I don't need to polish this entire thing. I like to go about halfway up the chisel and lay it down on the surface, making sure that the handle is not interfering, making me put it at an angle or something like that, making sure that it's actually flat on the glass. So this one feels pretty good, but it does feel like the back is raising it up just a touch. So what I'm gonna do is raise this piece of float glass up a little bit and sharpen it, flatten it by riding on this edge like this back and forth. So take a look at that. I'm gonna use two pieces of wood to get that float glass up higher. So I've got it wet and I'm using 220, which is pretty aggressive, but we saw how bad those mill marks were on the back of that. And as you can see, it's already changing tone, color tone, meaning I'm removing some of that texture. Initially with this paper, you really just gotta keep adding a little bit of water and all of that until it really gets stuck to the glass well. Again, about halfway up the chisel, I'm holding it with two fingers, a thumb on the back, and just putting pressure down so that it stays flat to the glass. So oh, if we look at the back, get the water cleaned off, you can see we're making progress on getting that flat. So what I'm looking for are the, these heavy grain lines. I'm looking for those to disappear out of this matte finish now that I'm creating, but I can still see them towards the center, which means the edges were a little bit high compared to the middle. So we're gonna keep going until those disappear. I'm confident that that is a flat surface. So we're gonna move on to the Sweetheart chisel and do the same thing. All right, so as you can see, I ended up moving my stones over here to hold the paper down. You can use a spray adhesive while it's dry uh, to get it stuck down to the table. I haven't had great results with that. It's a lot of cleanup. Um, so I prefer um, just wetting the paper. A lot of papers will stay down. Uh, the 220 grit is just a little heavy, so it curls up a lot more. Um, but we're gonna go on to the next grits of 400, 1,000, and 2,000 grit. So we're gonna do that on the back. Then we're gonna do that on the bevel using the jig 
uh, and that will be a really good start at establishing a sharp chisel. So go ahead and watch the process and uh, we'll compare chisels as we move through the entire thing. after flattening the backs and then quite the workout we've got pretty good results uh, with 3,000 grit sandpaper we're getting a reflection uh, we, we're decently flat there's some areas I'll show you in a minute uh, but the next step I'm gonna take it onto my stone because I want a super polished finish uh, my stone is 16,000 grit sandpaper so that We'll get rid of all these micro lines and give us a mirror polish along with the stropping at the end. So that's uh, the next step that you'll see here, um, straying from the float glass and sandpaper method. So after that 16,000 grit and stropping, we have a pretty good result. As you can see, my reflection, um, it is not absolutely smooth or perfect, but it's pretty, pretty good. And I would even call the other chisels on a similar level. So as you can see, you can see me in the reflection, uh, not as crisp, but pretty good. And again, all of this is related to how long it takes to get to this level. So again, you can see my reflection, um, not as well as either of the first two. Um, and that is the Lee Nelson, the Stanley Sweetheart, and then the Irwin. All right, so we flattened the backs. The next step is gonna be go through the entire process again with the chisel on the jig in position and at the correct angle. So we're going for 30 degrees, like I said, and then we're gonna put a secondary bevel of 35, which makes it a little bit uh, sharper at the end and easier to maintain. So this ch chisel fits into the jig and it tightens up, centers it, and holds it square all at the same time. However, how far this chisel protrudes through the jig determines what angle you're sharpening at. So for this to work, I need to set this to one and five thirty seconds of an inch on a measurement and put it on the jig to the edge of the blade to determine that that is going to be a 30 degree angle as the jig works. So I'm going to set that up and take you through the process. Now that I've locked it in, I'm going to start with 400 grit on the Lee Nielsen. I'll start with 220 on the others because they're in worse shape. Uh, the, 400 grit is plenty aggressive once the bevel is flat. So it's cut very evenly. I'm gonna go through all the paper grits with the same setting on the jig so that I don't need to readjust or make an error in that before I switch to the next chisel. So as I'm running this, I'm gonna start to check and feel on this smooth back if I can feel that edge rolling over. Once that edge starts to roll over, that's when I know that I am uh, getting a perfect intersection between the back and the bevel angle. As you can see here, I've switched to the stone just to get it up to that 16,000 grit. But what I wanted to talk about is how critical it is that you work the entire stone as evenly as possible because this wears, meaning that you will get uneven and non-flat surfaces. So after multiple uses, I will flatten the stone again using a diamond lapping plate. And that just ensures that I'm working with a flat stone. Again, all because it's related to a flat surface. I'm trying to create a perfect angle.
And as you can see, the dovetail feature here locks the chisel in and automatically squares as it pulls it up. So it is square to this roller wheel. It's protruding at the right angle so that it becomes a 30 degree angle when it's laid down. And that is the process of now going through the grits again. So we're gonna start at 220, work up to 2000 on the paper and then switch to the 16,000 grit stone. Then we will strop the edges for a mirror polish and then we're gonna compare the results. So we put water down because the grit that is re being removed from the paper and the steel that is being removed creates a slurry and that we want to keep away from the cutting action. So we use water in this case to just kind of clean the cut path. So I'm going to put it down, put double pressure and work around the paper or stone. And you can hear it cutting with the aggressive cut. Okay, so after those passes, what I'm gonna do is clean off this edge as good as I can, and I'm gonna look at the pattern and see if you can tell that I'm removing this mill mark pattern, um, or if I'm cutting at a weird angle, it would start to form an angle. Um, but essentially, this is establishing that this is square to the edge and the correct angle. If you look closely, you can maybe see uh, part of it. So let's keep going. If you listen, you can hear the burr on the back. So that's the step of this bevel working its way all the way to the back and starting to peel over the back side. So I'm gonna switch grits. All right, so on the Irwin chisel, what I have initially found on the primary bevel is you see the mill marks still here, and then you see that reflective portion. That is the new angle, so I'm actually having to cut an entire new bevel angle on this. And because it is only at the front edge, uh, I've got to establish that bevel all the way down to this backside so that both of these planes are totally flat and intersect with that back flat at a 30 degree angle. So that's a lot more work. <laughs> Okay, so after switching to 150 grit to speed up the process and a lot of exercise, you can see this bevel is moving towards the back. And you can also see that it is at a different angle. So this piece is actually a little high and it's taking it out and uh, leveling it out. The next step after establishing the bevel, uh, sharpening the bevel, and then adding the secondary bevel to 35 degrees, the final step is gonna be taking a strop with a rubbing compound on it, do a couple passes of that, and that's just gonna get the micro little bits of steel aligned and make it super sharp. So I do a couple passes with that. I'm gonna take my compound, rub it on the rough side of the leather, rub it on the smooth side of the leather, and then I'm gonna take my chisel, I'm gonna uh, line it up uh, with the flat side up, establish the bevel by just raising the chisel until it meets the leather and I'm going to give it a couple good uh, strong passes of pulling back. That's about all you need. Three, four passes uh, is plenty. I'm going to flip it to the smooth side of the leather. Do the same thing. Find the bevel, pull. Find the bevel, pull. And then I'm gonna make sure on the back side that I don't feel the burr anymore because if I have a burr, that piece needs to be removed. So I can lay it on the flat side and just do one pass and that'll remo remove any kind of micro burr that you feel on that edge. So again, find the bevel, flat side up and pull while pushing pretty good into the leather. That's gonna create that mirror polish 
And uh, I'm gonna do that on the rest of them and then we'll show you the results. Overall, pretty happy with how they turned out. I sharpened all of them uh, on the same process, had different results, which we will discuss. There were things that were easier and better about some and things that were harder, more difficult um, challenges on the others. And that was as to be expected. So let's take a look quickly at the edge results and then we'll actually cut with them and see what they do. Um, so on the Lee Nelson, you can see I have a pretty good polish here. And you can see that dark edge on the front, and that is the micro bevel um, at a different angle. So if I get it there, you can see that it's reflecting more. So it's just very, very small amount. Uh, polished up the backs, which you can see if I can get it to focus. Uh, pretty, pretty polished on the back. It's hard to see on the camera. On the uh, Stanley Sweetheart chisels, Again, the struggle that we started with were these mill marks. And you can see on the bevel, I was able to get that out. I was able to establish the secondary bevel. And on the back, yet again, uh, pretty good polish. Uh, the light and the camera make it difficult to show the results. Um, it actually looks more like a mirror in person than it does on camera, but that's okay. You get the point, it's a polished and flat back. Uh, the last one, the Irwin chisel, uh, worked out great. We had the mill marks. We had to um, establish those, or get rid of those on the back to flatten it. Um, you originally saw that on this, you can hear that. And then you come to the polished side and it's just totally different, no texture. Uh, we established the bevel on the front, which was the biggest challenge, was the primary bevel, bevel establishment of a new angle. And then you can see the front edge has that micro uh, secondary bevel. So overall, it ended at the same result. It took five times as long, and we'll talk about that as well. Let's check out the cuts. The results. We've gone through that entire process. We've sharpened everything up, and we see our secondary bevel we see it nice and shiny, mirror polish. How do we know that a chisel is sharp? What does sharp mean? Sharp means that the two intersecting angles are perfectly in alignment to where there is no blunt edge on the front, not at all. So what can we do besides taking this chisel and cutting ourselves with it as a terrible example of testing if a blade is sharp? Cutting your hair, it's a way to do it, it shaves, but is it safe? No. You could easily, with a razor, heavy, heavy razor, cut right into your skin. I've done it accidentally. It is no fun. Another thing that people do is they take the blade and they put it on their fingernail, and if it catches, it's sharp. Those are good ways to show that it's sharp, but really, is it safe? No. There's so many other options. Um, visual inspection is the first step. So as we've said, we've looked, we've seen that everything is polished. I'm looking for any edges that have a da damage point on it, a uh, gouge. Um, I'm looking at the reflection. So as you saw when I was changing the angle of the uh, bevel, it was reflecting or uh, be a shadow of the light, whatever I'm trying to say here. Um, that shadow is away from the light when it's reflected perfectly in bright white, the light is hitting it and reflecting into your eye. So that's a good way to know, is this edge sharp or not? Because like I said, as the bevels intersect, if that was perfectly flat, there's no blunt edge, meaning no light can reflect off of that tip. So I'm gonna look at the tip, and I'm gonna pivot back and forth, and if I see light reflecting off of the very tip, then I have a blunt edge, and that means that it is not sharp. I never once had to touch the edge. I never once had to shave anything with that. And I know that it's not sharp if I see light reflecting on the blunt tip. It could look super sharp. If you see light, it is not perfectly sharp. Um, another way to test is to grab a piece of softwood uh, just to see what this does uh, as you cut into that edge. Can you get a piece to curl and just as minimal effort as possible, can it cut? I'm not pushing any effort and I'm peeling the wood right off. So I'm gonna bring you in close. We're gonna look at all the edges, the results, and the ultimate test 
of cutting soft wood in grain with the chisel and we're going to see the results and see how well we did and compare them between the different types. Okay, so on the Lee nail set, we have a corner. I'm going to just establish that I'm cutting. I'm barely pushing and you can see that that is just peeling right off into a spiral. Uh, that means we are cutting the fibers, severing them extremely nicely, um, and that's working well. So as we switch, we're going to switch to the Stanley and do the same thing. And if you listen, you can hear it's a little different. So I'm going to try a real fine cut. And you can hear that segmented sound. So it's cutting, it's coiling, but there was a little bit more effort on that. I'm gonna take my Irwin chisel, do the same thing. So I'm peeling right off, do a heavier cut, get that coil going. And it's working well. So uh, I'm gonna do that Stanley again, just to see still has that sound. That is very interesting. If you listen closely, you can hear how it buffets. Da, 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 da. It cuts well, but it makes an interesting sound. So both all of those are sharp. Let's go and now pair end grain, which is one of the ultimate tests. Can I peel that off or does it powder up? Uh, we're going to put it in the vise to give it a fair shot and check them out. Okay, for the test, what we have is a beveled cut, and I've made this one a little bit higher up than this one so that we have a good edge to catch, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go from cheapest chisel to most expensive, and we're going to see if if I establish this flat reference on the surf, reference surface here, if I can get this ingrain to come off cleanly or work at all. So I'm going to come over, get just this tiny little start, and start cutting. If I maintain the flat on this reference surface, then these two bevels should line up perfectly. So this is the Irwin chisel on end grain. Definitely cuts, but I had to put quite a bit of effort, and that can become dangerous. The harder you push, the more dangerous the cut is. So we're gonna step up now to the Stanley. I'm gonna do the same thing with only cutting a portion of the wood on the blade. It came off in a sheet, uh, but it did require effort. Ingrain is very hard to cut without crushing the fibers um, or fighting, so. Okay, the Stanley did a little bit better, to be honest. And the last one is the Lee Nielsen, and we're gonna do the same thing, get this lined up with a small edge and cut. So much less effort and an amazing cut. So I am used to that level of a cut on a sharp chisel. And if we look at that, this is perfectly in alignment. Uh, taking our rule, there's no edge to catch. And overall, super pleased with that cut. So overall, what is my opinion of buying an Irwin chisel versus a Lee Nelson, a low tier tool at a cheaper price versus a high priced premium option using premium materials. Um, it is a balance that you have to find for yourself. And that is because some people use a chisel once a year, some people choose it, use a chisel and sharpen them multiple times a day on a daily basis and that is the camp that I fall in. I am using a Lee Nielsen on a daily basis. Sometimes I sharpen multiple times a day. 
uh, just to touch it up. If I'm doing a bunch of ingrain or something that is really working that edge, I need to keep it up. So I reach for a premium tool. I'm doing it as a job. So if you like nice tools, if you like things that work well, then the Lee Nielsen is mo by far a better option than the Irwin chisel. The steel, how fast the edge uh, was uh, fixed on the stone or the sandpaper. This one, I actually use the sandpaper except for the 16,000 grit stone. Um, I use sandpaper just like the other chisels just to make sure that we were getting similar results based off of the method. Um, between the lower tier options, the Stanley Sweetheart Cheer Sizzle Chisel Series and the Irwin Marples, they even had a very different result. The Stanley went very quickly. Um, I was able to get rid of the mill marks faster. Those initial mill marks and flattening um, on the back and the bevel, they started off as less dramatic as the Irwin. Uh, they're more expensive. They have a little bit better steel. They have a nicer feeling handle and that is totally a preference thing for me. Um, they're almost identical to the Lee Nielsen um, and that's because they're all based off of a Stanley design originally. So between these two, I still gravitate towards finding the mid-tier option of the Stanley Sweetheart. Um, it cut pretty good. You saw that it made an interesting noise as it was cutting, almost a segmented sound, um, but it did cut well. It took less effort uh, on the miter cut you saw in the center it was able to peel off the ingrain and sheets versus just crushing the fibers. Uh, it took a lot more effort than the Lee Nielsen, but it did cut and remain, the, sh the sheets remained together, which means it was severing fibers versus crushing them into powder, uh, where I say the Irwin kind of did that. Um, it didn't cut near as well um, on that ingrain. It took twice as much effort to push through, even though when you look at the edge, and see that there's no reflection on where those two bevels intersect. Um, it is a sharp chisel. However, it just did not cut as well. Um, I, that's obviously related to the type of steel, I guess. I, I'm not an expert there, but results uh, matter through the same process. Uh, as close as I could do it, that's the results that I got. Um, I definitely think people can get better results. People could spend, instead of 45 minutes reestablishing a bevel. Um, I will not do that for the rest of these chisels. That would be a huge factor. Whereas this chisel took me 10 minutes to uh, go from start to finish. This one took me 45 minutes almost to establish a new bevel because the bevel was different than what I wanted. So uh, cleaning up all the mill marks and establishing that new bevel took a dramatic amount of time difference um, and if you're doing that for an entire set, yes, this was less than $100 for uh, one, two, three, four, five chisels. Um, but you're going to eat that cost in all the time it takes to get this up to a really high quality functioning level. Um, and then in the end, you still aren't going to get the best results. That doesn't mean that they're not good enough for what you do um, or want in the chisel. Uh, these would be excellent for construction, door jams, things like that. Uh, but in fine woodworking, hardwoods that you need precision and a good, safe cut quickly, um, I found that they were not as good. The middle of the road option, I, I would almost say these are a great starter chisel versus the cheapest option um, because I got really quick results on flattening and polishing, sharpening, um, and pretty dang good results on cutting. So. This is a great option. It's a little more pricey. You get the same, you get a set full of different dimensions um, and it's a great starter set in my opinion. Uh, edge retention, time will tell on all of these, how long will they hold the edge? That's important because you don't wanna spend time sanding and polishing the edge. You wanna be spending time working the wood. So uh, that's a necessary evil. Uh, some people really enjoy sand, uh, sharpening and some people do not enjoy it, but if it's a quick process uh, with a high quality steel, it's very painless and you can get it done, move on and get right back to woodworking. Whereas a cheaper steel takes a lot more time and effort, energy. Uh, for me, not worth it.
Um, I'm going to speak to the quality of materials and the different tiers as well in sharpening materials and supplies. Um, I use a Shapton glass stone, which is definitely a premium level option. There's a mid tier options of different stones, different diamond plates, lots of that all the way down to the cheapest um, entry level point of sandpaper on flat glass. Uh, those things are the similar, uh, uh, I don't normally use the glass and sandpaper method. I go right to the stones because I appreciate the quality and the results that I get from those. I understand that they're more expensive and that's not for everyone. I understand that people get great results with paper. All of those things are personal preference when it comes down to it. In the end, I prefer the high quality option that I can rely on uh, and know it in and out. Um, it's just like the chisels and other tools where there are multiple levels of tool purchase. Um, for me, premium on a daily basis use uh, is one reason that I want premium on the quality results, the materials, how long they last, how easy it is. And I was reminded on that 16,000 grit stone when I put the jig on the stone and worked it back and forth, how much more I enjoyed that versus trying to hold down paper, wet paper on stone uh, or on glass. And that frustrated me more than just grabbing the stone, going to town and getting the results that I wanted. So I wanted to speak to that just like any tool purchase. I think it's worth saving up for that mid-tier option or that premium option before buying anything uh, because my time is much more valuable to me than it is in uh, spending a ton of effort on something that's just, it works, but and you gotta put in a lot of effort to get there, but for me, that's not worth it. I would rather be using that time working on the project or the piece and developing my woodworking skills. So long story short, I am impressed with how all the results are. I am gonna stick with the high quality options. I understand that that's not for everyone. Um, I definitely am going to use the mid-tier option in my shop. Uh, I bought four sets of the Stanley chisels before ever even opening them uh, for students. I'm gonna be teaching up to four students at once and I wanted to use a mid-tier option that I was confident was gonna give me good results, be able to be worked and learned on by the students, and um, I determined that it's better than the lowest price option, and I'm glad that I did not purchase those blindly because I would have been upset that we would have spent an entire day of me showing someone how to sharpen this chisel versus an hour uh, showing them how to sharpen this chisel. So that's a huge advantage for me I'm, I'm happy with that decision and I'm glad that it worked out. I will be using these on a regular basis. Um, overall, I hope you enjoyed that video. I hope I can teach you something that you didn't know. You may know more than me in different areas and that's okay. Uh, but I wanted to show how I work in my shop. I, if you enjoy that, please follow along by subscribing to my channel and help me out by liking this video. We'll catch you on the next one. See you later.